Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. My first guest in this week's programme has been described in the French press as the spearhead of Spanish diplomacy. José Manuel Álvarez was Spain's ambassador to France in 2020 and he became the foreign minister of Spain the following year. He's personally close to Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez, who made him his special advisor on international affairs when Sánchez came to power in 2018. But that power is now waning. In the municipal and regional elections last month, Sanchez's socialists lost ground and both the right and the far right made gains. As a result, the prime minister has called an early general election for July the 23rd, just three weeks after Spain takes over the rotating presidency of the European Union. Foreign Minister, welcome to Talking Europe. Thank you. Let's start a bit with uh, some of the big international news from Ukraine and the blowing of the Kachovka Dam. Uh, the authorities in Kiev are saying that the world is responding too slowly to the humanitarian situation there. Is the EU responding too slowly, do you think? EU is always trying to respond as quick as possible to all needs, whether it's humanitarian, to take care of the refugees, and militarily as well. And of course, Spain, bilaterally, we are preparing a very important package of humanitarian aid, and our voice will be raised in Brussels to make sure that EU does it and EU will respond. Let's talk about the uh, presidency of the EU that uh, you're going to take up in uh, a few weeks. Um, obviously, a national election campaign takes up a lot of time and energy. Is there a risk that the EU presidency will just slide down the list of priorities? Not at all. Not the slightest possibility. There has been presidencies of the EU of falsehood. The last French president was a great success, so three voting two for the presidential election, one for legislative elections, a change of government. There have been presidencies with caretaker governments, changing of government in the middle. There's been all sorts of presidents. We've been working for a year and a half. Myself, mm -hmm. I'm the president of the organizing committee, and we have been working for more than a year. Mm -hmm. We have set the themes, the cities in which there will be the councils, uh, the main summits, the dates, Everything is ready and it's going to be a great success. In terms of the schedule, I understand, but won't your EU partners actually sit back and wait until they see who is in power in Madrid? Because if it ends up being the PP, the Conservative Party, they don't have exactly the same approach to you on certain things, the minimum wage, for example. They don't have exactly the same European orientation as, as the socialists do. I agree with you in the first mm. part, uh, the mm. second part, but not in the first part of what mm. you said. I agree with you in the, in the second part, because mm. the choice is not PP. It's a coalition of PP plus plus the extreme right. And of course, they, there is a uh, big difference with the European agenda on the Green Deal, mm -hmm. on equality between men and women in very, very important topics. A coalition of right and extreme right could behave very differently. But uh, our partners will not sit back. I talk with all my colleagues in Brussels. They are waiting so, for the Spanish leadership because it's a very pro-European government. So, and society. so you really don't get the sense that you're going to lose two months, July and August, and then the real work starts in September. You don't think that's going to happen? Not at all. Yeah. Uh, July the 6th, the Commission will come to Madrid and we will have an exchange. Yeah. July 17th and 18th, a few days before the election, there will be a summit that hasn't been placed since 2015 between the EU and Latin America. All that is going to be a great success. On the rise of the right and the far right, which you've alluded to, um, obviously there isn't an alliance between those two forces and all the countries that I'm mentioning, but there has been certainly a rise of the right in Sweden, Finland, Bulgaria, Greece, now in Spain. Um, the, is there a problem with the left's political offer? There's something that isn't connecting with voters, and you must be concerned about that in the light of the European elections next year. The president has called the election to clarify this, because it's very important what will happen in the next elections in Spain, in the European Parliament for Europe. Mm -hmm. There is a challenge to European values coming from the outside, from the illegal Russian aggression, but also from within our societies. And I want to recall that European values are not only beautiful philosophical ideas, mm. they are also the engine of mm. growth and stability in Europe for many decades. That cannot be changed. And in Spain, in Spain, the party that can stop that is the Socialist Party. 
Right, but the socialists have to stand for something, not only against the PP and Vox. And when Pedro Sanchez says there's no difference between the two of them, isn't that a kind of project fear? It's trying to scare people instead of the socialists actually saying why people should vote for them rather than against the other two. What the president po points out is that the, the, the choice, I mean, the alternative to the current government, it's one of a very radical right and extreme right. And that's, that's accurate and that's objective. But we have proposals. The first one, as in this week, in the ministerial OECD meeting, in which we have seen the forecast for the Spanish economy, a growth that is double the EU, an inflation among the lowest in the European Union, and all this with a social seal, protecting people, giving public health, public education, all that cannot be stopped. And speaking of protecting people, that's actually a big theme in your upcoming EU presidency. Uh, you want an, an EU directive on minimum wages, if possible. You want uh, more flexibility in the stability and growth pact so that countries have the fiscal room for more social policies, don't you? We think that the extraordinary time Mm. require extraordinary measures. That doesn't mean that the measures have to be forever. That doesn't mean weakening uh, the stability pact, but acknowledging the situation. If we compare how Europe got out of the financial crisis and how Europe has done it out of COVID and how we are facing the social and economic consequences of the brutal aggression of Russia to Ukraine, all Europeans prefer the current method that the old one. Because when we are united, when we have solidarity, when we have flexibility for extraordinary times, we get out of the crisis faster, in better shape, and leaving less people behind. You, you've been very active on the whole energy question. Uh, Spain has called for more interconnections for electricity. And in your EU presidency, you want to, quote, enrich the European Commission's proposal on reforming the electricity market. Uh, just explain a, a little bit of that for us. I think that everyone can agree that Europe cannot be in the same situation that we found ourselves uh, in February 24th of last year. We cannot be blackmailed by any country in the world with gas or energy. That means reforming our energy market. What that means? Completing interconnection to make sure that we can share our energy mix. Mm. Secondly, pushing renewable energies, because the part in the, in the energy mix that we have of renewables is the part of energy sovereignty, and maintaining, maintaining systems as the ceiling for the gas price that we have for the Iberian Peninsula to make sure that with each country we can go through this crisis. All that is mm. part of that reform. Uh, about the... Uh, summit between the EU and Latin American and Caribbean countries, which again, Spain has highlighted as one of the uh, key points in its upcoming presidency. Um, what are you expecting from that? Because uh, the French president, for example, has put forward quite stringent conditions on some of those countries uh, for any trade rapprochement uh, between uh, the, th those countries and the EU. D do you agree that strong conditions have to be applied? Europe needs French and allies in the world, very mm. especially in this mm. uh, international setting. What we expect of a summit that the, the last one was in 2015, so it's really important, is to bring Latin America forever to the heart of the European agenda. So we need a political signal, and the summit will be mm. 60 leaders around the table, what mm. that means in terms of population and GDP in the world. Secondly, a very important working and investment program from Europe to Latin America. And third, moving forward, with the trade agreements with Chile, with Mexico, with Mercosur, because for them, they are not only trade agreement, it's also a signal of engagement, of political engagement in the long term. But if this kind of agreement upsets beef producers in Spain or Ireland, for example, doesn't that lead to more populist politics of the kind that you... Uh, are but we have opposed? to tell the truth to the people about mm. those uh, agreements. The best way of making sure that Latin America will be within the Paris Agreement is through Mercosur, that Brazil is there. We can talk about specific issues that can be improved, but what we cannot put into question is the good of those trade agreements for both Europe and Latin America. On Gibraltar, your country says that it's ready for 
a shared zone of prosperity in the light of, of Brexit. Um, what, what's the latest? What, what's the main blockage? Where's it coming from at the moment? In December, we put a global deal on the table. So Spain has already put a global deal to get that zone of common prosperity between Gibraltar and Camp of Gibraltar. Uh, we are waiting, we are still waiting for the United Kingdom to give uh, the answer. For us, the thing is clear. We want that zone of common prosperity and the proposal is at the table. It's up to the United Kingdom so, to say yes or no. So the main issue is around freedom of, of, of goods while ensuring the, the integrity of the, of the single European market, right? So it's, it's kind of slightly similar to the Northern Irish problem. It must be, it must be a global deal, and mm. there are several aspects. Free movement of people, free movement of goods, mm. if we really want to, uh, Gibraltar to be integrated. With, with Campo de Gibraltar and in European Union, uh, common use of, of the airport and the removal of any physical barrier mm. for that free movement. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for being my guest, José Manuel Álvarez, Foreign Minister of Spain. Do stay with us. I'll be back in part two with another Foreign Minister, Buyar Osmani, who leads the uh, Foreign Ministry of the Republic of North Macedonia.